Now, in U.S. presidential politics, former President Trump continues to bounce around from courthouse to the campaign trail. This morning, he was back to face trial for his statements about former columnist E. Jean Carroll's sexual assault allegations in 2019. Just ahead of the New Hampshire primary, he got a boost from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who decided to drop out of the race and back him. Conservative lawyer George Conway now joins Michelle Martin with incisive analysis on how Trump's legal woes are playing out and shaping this campaign. Thanks, Christiane. George Conway, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. So, look, I know you're a lawyer and a legal analyst. You're not a political analyst, per se. But I did want to get your take on what we've just seen in Iowa. As we are speaking now, the Iowa caucuses are just behind us. You know, it's, um, by all accounts, decisive victory for the former president there. Just what are your thoughts about that? Well, I mean, this is where we are. I mean, I, I've been saying for quite some time that I thought that we're going to have the first, for the first time, running as a major party candidate, a convicted felon. And that's what he, I think he will be that by the time the fall rolls around, because I do think the trial here in the District of Columbia of the January 6th trial, the one brought, the case brought by Jack Smith just against him before Judge Chutkin here in the district, I think that one's going to go to trial. Um, you know, it's just a remarkable confluence of firsts. I mean, we have the first adjudicated rapist who is going to win a major party nomination, the first person who has been, you know, who, who is under indictment in four separate jurisdictions with 91 counts. I mean, it, it, it is just absolutely unprecedented. But with Donald Trump, it's almost it's almost inevitable that this, this was going to happen. Do you have any thoughts about why these very serious allegations don't seem to make much difference in, a, in the political realm? I mean, you have, you know, close connections to people in the Republican political world, and I'm just interested in what you think about that. It's partisanship run amok, in part, and then I think a lot of this, I mean, I, and I do think there is some segment of the population that wants a strong man, um, and I, I don't mean that in a complimentary way. I mean that in the, uh, in the sense of a, of a quasi-dictatorial authoritarian figure. Uh, they want to just basically assume the facts that they think are true are true. They don't want to think. They don't. They're not interested in evidence. But I think another thing that's going on here, I think a lot of this is that people don't want to admit that they were wrong about Donald Trump. They don't want to admit that he's a bad person because if they admit that he's a bad person, then they, by extension, are admitting that they are not good people for supporting him, or at least it tarnishes them in their own eyes. So they have to justify where they've been and 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 where they're going um, because they, they they just don't want to admit that he led them astray and and that they've been suckered and that that that, that they're wrong and that that he's bad. I, I think that's just a, a big part of it. Is that true? You think that's true for people in your own orbit? Oh, well, you know, I mean, my orbit's changed a bit over the last few years. But I think, you know, part of it is not wanting to admit you're wrong. But part of it also is um, there's an identity there. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a tribalism there. And, you know, you don't, you don't want to be excluded from the tribe because you, don't, you think the other tribe, the, the liberals who you've been hating on for so many years— they're never going to accept you, and if you if you dare question uh, the leader, um, you'll be cast out of your own group, and you'll be, you'll be homeless. The other thing that I think is going on is there's an economy that has been built around Trump and Trumpism. Um, I think that there's a whole you know you have all of these consultants and all of these politicians whose livelihoods or their chosen careers or their chosen course of of, of their lives is dependent upon not uh, antagonizing other people in that community. And so, I mean, you see that with members of Congress who are who, who have to fear being primary. You see that with political consultants. I mean, for example, uh, the, the, it was reported just the other day that the Trump 
campaign is saying nobody should hire Jeff Rowe, who was a political advisor, a chief political advisor for Ron DeSantis, that they he's going to be blacklisted and nobody wants to be blacklisted. Nobody wants to be cast out of the tribe. And there is just there's also fear of physical intimidation. And I think we saw that to some extent. Uh, with uh, Lindsey Graham back in January of 2021, where he dared utter that he'd been, he was done with Trump or something like that. And he was accosted at an airport by, by, by Trumpers. And you saw it also. I mean, one of the things that you've seen um, uh, when Liz Cheney was running for reelection in Wyoming, she had to have a big security detail in Wyoming with you know, she's never known. And it, it, there is a there is certainly a degree of physical intimidation. And um, that, you know, frankly, that's what January 6th was all about. So let's pivot around to the, the subject that sort of brought us together today, which is you have actually said that you think that Trump will, quote, spend the rest of his life in jail. You really think that? I do think that. I mean, he's either going to become president or he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. He certainly deserves to spend the, life, the rest of his life in prison. I think that if you take any combination of the counts in these four indictments, uh, with which he's been charged, you will take almost any conviction and almost any combination of them is going to uh, put him in jail for a number of years. And you know, this is a this is a seventy seven year old man. So I, I I think there is a very good chance he'll spend the rest of his life in jail. And and that's part of the dynamic that is going on here. He knows that. I mean, he's not a strategic thinker. He's a he's a sociopath. He's a he's a he's a man with a reptilian. I'm not going to say intellect, but he understands that he is cornered. And that's when people, you know, people like him with that kind of psychology are the most dangerous. But he understands that. And he understands that the only way for him to escape the trouble that he's in is to be elected president. Do you think that the purpose of this presidential campaign is to keep him out of jail? I think that is one major purpose. I think another major purpose is to he does, you know, he's motivated by the things that motivate narcissistic sociopaths, which is power, um, praise, uh, and and a desire to to inflict revenge on people who have defied him. And I, I think that we've seen that in some of what what you know what he's his people are planning. For 2025, should he be elected? I mean, they're going to they're going to seek retribution. Uh, he says he's seeking retribution on behalf of uh, the American public, or at least his slice of the American public. But that's what motivates him. I don't think you can understand what Donald Trump says and does on a daily basis simply by saying, "Oh, he's a bad guy. He's a Republican. He's a authoritarian. He's he's racist. He's misogynist. He's this or that." You have to tie it into his fundamental psychological profile. People should not shy away from that, okay? Because I do not think you can understand his behavior without understanding his psychology. And I think we're seeing that in the courtroom as, as, it, as it's happening today uh, or this week in the E. Jean Carroll trial. We're going to see it even more in the future. So what, let's talk about of, of the of the he's got there are 91 felony accounts, felony accounts across four cases. What do you think is the strongest of those? Oh, well, I think the strongest one, the strongest case, I think, is a, which is a slam dunk case because it's so simple, is the case in Florida, the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Uh, you know, there, there's no there, there's really no factual dispute about what happened there because he was caught red handed with the documents. The documents do not belong to him. They belong to the United States of America. They had classified document markings. And it doesn't even matter that they were, in fact, quote unquote, classified because the charges that he has been uh, that were filed against him were include charges under the Espionage Act. And and those charges do not turn on specific, whether they're specifically marked as classified, they simply turn on whether or not it's national defense information of any degree of significant sensitivity. And you have that and the fact that there are witnesses and there's video and, and all sorts of evidence that he tried to hide those and did hide those documents from the FBI and that he failed to produce them when he was served with a subpoena 
by the De Department of Justice and that he had his lawyers lie to the Department of Justice. And that's those are simple, simple, easily provable acts of obstruction of justice. And when that case goes to trial, um, I think I don't know that it's going to go to trial this year because uh, it's hard to say what the judge there is doing in terms of scheduling. But I don't he doesn't have a defense in that case, just not not a shred of a defense. The other case that has gotten a lot of attention and that you have written about most recently is the case connected to the former president's role in the January 6 mob attack on the Capitol. And in that case, one of the things that has gotten a lot of attention from legal analysts and legal scholars is this very sweeping claim, basically saying that he has total immunity for anything that he does or anything that he did while in the office of the presidency. So you wrote about that. And the headline of the piece was that Trump's lawyer walked into a trap. What's the trap he walked into? Would you just lay that out for us? Well, the trap that they, they walked into was that they were pushing arguments that were in tension with each other, or they were pushing, they, 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 for example, they, they were, their principal argument is that there is an inherent immunity in the Constitution that comes with the presidents that means that you cannot be subject to essentially to any legal process. They that that does not that those that line of cases has never been applied to the presidents in in the criminal context. It's been applied in the civil context. And the cases are based upon the notion that if you have you know, the president does things that affect so many people that if you allow them all to sue, if he did something that harmed them, the president would be continually and sue them sue the president personally for damages. You'd end up with a situation where the president would be worrying about everything he does and who is going to sue him for what. And the president will be worried more about his personal finances and more about the cost of defending litigation than he would be actually doing his job. But again, that rationale only applies to in the civil context, and it only extends uh, by the by the terms of the case law. The case, the leading case, being a case called Nixon against Fitzgerald, which was decided in 1982 to the outer perimeter of the president's official responsibilities. Now, that's a pretty broad standard. It's basically as broad as you can make it reasonably, but it's, you know, it doesn't apply to essentially conducting a coup. But the other point is, it's never been applied to the criminal context. And that's the, that's the thing that, 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 that I, that I think he's going to absolutely lose on, which is the notion that somehow you can extend this civil liability doctrine to the criminal the criminal context. Now, the trap that he set for himself is what had he made a secondary argument, an argument that is extremely weak, based upon something called the impeachment judgment clause. And what the impeachment judgment clause of the Constitution, which is an Article One of the Constitution, because it deals with Congress's powers, it says that. If you if some if an officer of the United States is removed from office by the impeachment process, in other words, impeached by the House and convicted by the Senate and removed as a result of the Senate conviction, he can nonetheless be charged in the courts of law thereafter for any criminal conduct that the that was covered by the impeachment. What what Trump has been arguing is that by by you could flip that over and say you can only be charged if you are convicted by the Senate. And that's not what the clause said. But what, what he did also, at, in, in, in what his lawyers did at this argument was, at the same time that they were making this broad, absolute criminal immunity argument, they were saying, and they were saying that we need that broad criminal immunity because... Um, we have to fear political prosecutions when one administration goes in and tries to prosecute the people in the last administration, the president of the last administration. He's saying we can't have that because we need to protect um, um, from political prosecutions. But then they're saying at the same time, the exception is if the president is convicted by the Senate, you can nonetheless charge him, which is inconsistent with the claim of absolute immunity. Absolute immunity. Right. Because that's a political proceeding. The impeachment is a political proceeding. It's not a criminal proceeding. Mr. Conway, you were actually in the courtroom. Can you just try to describe the argument and the exchange between one of Mr. Trump's lawyers and Judge Florence Pan, where you kind of laid out what you're describing as the, the, the difficulties of that argument? Yeah, I mean, what she was doing was she was trying to pin him down and get concession, a concession from him that he was arguing for an immunity so broad and so absolute that a president of the United States could send SEAL Team 6 
oh, to the Capitol or wherever to assassinate political a political rival and be immune from prosecution for that criminal act. And and she he he was refusing to give that concession cleanly. He was saying yes, but and the but was oh, but a president could still uh, certainly a president that did that would be impeached and removed, and then he could be prosecuted because that's what the impeachment judgment clause that I described earlier says. The problem with that is that means the president isn't absolutely immune, and that was sort of the gotcha that that, that the trap that uh, Judge Pan was leading the lawyer into, and the the lawyer realized he was being cornered, and he kept trying to avoid uh, avoid falling into the trap by talking as fast as he could and, and talking about things other than that weren't responsive to her answer. And then there's also the tension involved between you know set, set his position that the president shouldn't be prosecutable because we, we fear political prosecutions, while at the same time saying, but a president can be prosecuted if the most political body in, in the United States or in, in the United States government, which is the Congress of the United States, says so. And so basically, when she got done with him, his, his position looked nonsensical. It looked ridiculous. And, and that was only about 10 or 15 minutes into the argument, and you knew which way the panel was going to come out at that point, because he didn't get any help from any of the other judges. You know, you know what, look, he is, like any defendant, entitled to a vigorous defense, right? Yes. So, and he is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, like any defendant. But, I mean, it is one of sort of the axioms of the American experience that no one is above the law in the United States. Right. No one. I mean, it is right. sort of fundamental, not just to American identity, but to American law. Like, that is who we say we are. And I sort of wonder, is there any part of you that worries, as an officer of the court, that someone is making an argument that, you know, that someone, this particular singular figure, can never be prosecuted or held to account in court for anything that he does. I just, I just wondered if you thought about that. Well, I, I, I do. Work, I mean, I don't think it's an argument that you know should cause someone to lose their bar license, but I do think it's an argument that is very, very dangerous if it were ever taken too seriously. And, and here's here's why: it's not just that we are a nation of of, of, of laws and not of individuals, but it's the fact that this is part and parcel of what an authoritarian leader wants to have. Authoritarian leaders, if you if you if you talk to students of of history and students of, of, of international political science, I and mean, what they will tell you is that you know authoritarians are criminals, and they one of the re, one of the things that they seek is the ability to do whatever they please and make the law whatever they want and make it the law make people the, of their choosing subject to the law while nonetheless not being subject to the law themselves. This is not really that new for Trump. I mean, Trump is someone who said, I think back in 2019 or 2018, Article 2 of the Constitution, the Constitution, the part of the Constitution that deals with the president, allows me to do what get, to do whatever I want. He actually believes that, but that's Again, that's that's because of that's he, he believes that not because he's a legal scholar, but that's his essential nature. George Conway, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you.